Yeah, yeah, one, two, one, two. You know how we do with your boy BQ. This is the Impact Lounge. This is your Impact Wrestling Review. I just recorded this entire review. And uh, the Wi-Fi went out. I don't even know when it went out exactly. Because uh, I take the StreamYard tab off after a while. And I'm not necessarily looking at myself. Because I think it's kind of awkward sometimes. So Wi-Fi went out. Um, I'm redoing this entire pod for you. So I'm not streaming live because um, I didn't realize when you live stream that it doesn't put the review or your video, your upload in your videos tab. It puts it in the live tab, which I understood that. But I also thought uh, it would be in the videos tab. So when someone visits the Impact Lounge and they're looking for the latest upload, it's showing a review from like five weeks ago. So that's not going to work for me. So uh we're not going to do it like that no more. Um, I'd even catch that when we were doing the Cool Factor podcast. I don't I don't know why I didn't catch it. Maybe because I just didn't really care uh, to, to check up on the YouTube channel that much. But yeah, that's not going to happen anymore. So, um, you know, there's going to be some live streams here and there. But uh, that's not that's not how we're going to run things around here anymore. So if it's your first time here, consider hitting the subscribe button. It's the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. We're going to get into this Impact Wrestling review here shortly but first we're going to talk mercedes martinez or mercedes monet she has uh publicly stated that uh, she had interest in a match with mickey james and if you guys remember around hard to kill i had said there's no way that mickey james is going to lose that match because if there's even a point zero 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 one percent chance that they can get a mercedes monet match versus mickey james there's no way they're going to retire Mickey James. There's no way she's going to lose because at the end of the day, that's the biggest money match they can do is Mickey James versus Mercedes Monet. So will it happen? Hmm, I don't know, but I think it very possibly will because, you know, she's a wrestling fan. This isn't, uh, you know, Mandy Rose or something like that. This is a real genuine wrestling fan who's familiar with the other companies, watches the other companies, knows what's going on, and I think would have interest in well she's even said this much but bouncing around and working with other companies and working with the best because sasha banks came from the wwe nxt bubble to where you know so they say you know she's had these good matches with this and this at the end of the day she was really wrestling like the same three or four girls over and over she doesn't have that long um you know list of indie matches and indie classics that she had and she worked with this person and that person like she didn't it was just like she was within that bubble for the majority of her career so you know i don't think she's someone that wants to be locked down anywhere uh maybe you know maybe ultimately we could see her in an AEW, but i think right now it's more about wrestling who she wants to wrestle and having those good matches and then you know right now she's doing the new japan thing I'm, I'm sure she's going to make an indie tour at some point as well. And she'll draw a lot of money doing that. And the WWE audience, they're very brand loyal, which impact fans are very much like that too. an AEW fan. I mean, that, it's, that's just kind of how it is, but all of a sudden now the impact, I mean, excuse me, the WWE audience like hates her. It's, it's the wildest thing in the world because they get offended when someone doesn't want to be there. So, you know, right now she's a little bit like public enemy number one in the wrestling world. But, um, you know, she she's already bringing a lot of business to New Japan. So it definitely would be an Impact's best interest to do something like that. You know, and you notice that with Mickey James right now, like the last rodeo, I thought it was like Ric Flair when it was like, next time you lose, your career is done. She basically was like, if I lose on my way to the knockout championship, I'll, I'll retire. But right now they've seen to pull back because, you know, she said, it's not my last rodeo. It's not my first rodeo. I don't know what the hell she, she was saying, but they don't, it, it's not being presented. Like she's going to retire next time she loses, like her career is over. It seems like that was like a stipulation up till now. You know what I'm saying? So with that being said, there's that possibility. If she wrestles her, like impacts could easily put that fucking knockouts title on her, you know? So um, we'll see. I hope it happens. I think it's very, very possible though. Um, I think it is more than um, more than a lot of WWE departures are. I think this is one that that is very, very possible. Um, you know, I want to talk about real quick. They're going to be bringing back the uh, the impact diary thing. Um, I guess that's going to be on impact plus. And 
you know, they've teased that they got Josh Alexander, um, Giselle Shaw. There was a, there was a few people. I, I, I didn't write the names down. And I think it's a very, um, a very good idea. I, I've been saying that for a while to bring back those kind of segments. Uh, I thought the really good one years ago that they did was like my first day in Impact. And, I, you know, I always talk about this peeling back that curtain a little bit to, to just for some more natural content with the wrestlers. Cause even, even when there is interviews where there's Josh Matthews, whoever just very much when you came to impact wrestling, what do you, what was your thought process? You know, I guess that's my Tom Hannafin right there, but uh, we just don't get a lot of like real naturalness from the wrestlers. And, and every time there is an interview, there's music and silliness, you know? So, uh, you know, they're bringing back the diary thing. Uh, I think that's a great, great idea. All right. So um, we're going to talk impact here. First, I want to talk viewership. Bringing this up on the screen. You can ignore January 26. I know that's highlighted. That's just from the, the graphic that I pulled. Just, just go ahead and ignore January 26. February 2nd was the episode that kicked off with the Bullet Club versus uh, Kashida and, and whoever his partner was. I think Gates is the last name. I'm just not familiar with the dude. And uh, excellent freaking opening match. Excellent tag team match. And I was saying back then, if I were flipping through the channels, didn't watch a whole lot of impact, and I saw that, it would make me want to watch the rest of the episode and tune in the next week. So I was saying I'm, I'm very curious to see what the viewership is going to be, what the holdover. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a decent holdover. And then February 9 happens. And this was the episode that I reviewed last week that I said was horrible. And it was. I know that's my opinion. But in this case, it's the correct opinion. It was an awful, awful episode that I want to pretend never happened. And clearly, with the large dip here in viewership. And, you know, th this is one of the things that I say that I know a lot of people don't agree with me on. Like, they don't, they think I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But I'm always bringing up the start time of the match or the start time of the, the, the episode when we start seeing the first match and who we're seeing. I've been probably for a year now talking about this. And uh, what have I been saying? That you can do the highlights. You can do we on the night. Don't do both. Last week, they decided they were going to do both. The episode, as far as the wrestling, doesn't kick off until about two and a half minutes into the show. Three minutes. And it's Brian Myers. And what have I said? I was like, if you take too long to start the show, people are going to tune out. And, you know, it's the AEW strategy. 45 seconds, jump into the first match, and it's someone you want to see. And even though I like Brian Myers a lot, you can't tell me as a, as a casual wrestling fan that you click on the channel and you see him coming out and Tom Hannafin's letting you know it's a first time ever matchup. And it's versus dirty dango and it's for a number one contendership opportunity for the world title you cannot tell me someone is going to continue to watch that show so uh they deserved this viewership that they received it should have been lower they deserved for it to be lower because the episode was that bad this episode this week i felt was like a bounce back episode i thought it, i thought it was um overall very solid i had an issue with the finishes and i'm going to get into that but it didn't distract me from enjoying the episode and thinking that it was an overall good episode. We're going to get into these finishes and I, I don't fully understand them, but uh, you know, it's, it's the impact way. So we, you know, we got a little bit of a bounce back in viewership this week and this episode was more comparable to that February 2nd episode with a great opening match. There's a formula that works for impact. It's the bookend formula. It's the great opener. It's the great main event. And in the middle, you can have a swinger. You can have a decay. But you can't have too much comedy. You can't have too much spookiness. But there's a place for everything in the middle. If you set the tone with the episode with an excellent match. And you're building towards an excellent match in the main event. 
you you can throw some other stuff in there. But that's a strategy that works. It clearly works for them. The bookend strategy. That's not what last week's episode was. Last week was, let's take forever to start. Let's put two, you know, WWE quote unquote, not my opinion. I'm just, again, casual wrestling fan. Two WWE jobbers in opening match for an opportunity to wrestle for the world title and then present, I mean, promote another WWE jobber in a main event, getting a title shot for a title that means nothing. So they just did everything wrong last week. I'm not trying to be like overly negative. They deserved bad viewership last week. Um, we'll see what it is, uh, you know, going forward. I hope that this isn't a, a trend a pattern where it's a good episode, bad episode, good episode, bad episode. You know, the, the audience was dead last week. Again, it was probably the second half of the day of tapings. Totally get it. But uh, this was this was what I felt was a bounce back episode. So let's get into it, baby. Uh, let's talk BTI. I actually watched it this week. I had to see Steph Delander in action again and how they were going to present her on screen. And she takes on... Deanna Perazzo. And this this was another thing from last week's episode. You know, the food fight thing. They've never presented Dion on screen in that way ever. And uh, I was like, how are they going to follow up Deanna this week after that? Deanna is like clearly transitioning to a baby face. And I don't think it's because she has a big baby face run in her. I, I really think these are her closing, her, her ending days with the company. Um, and even if she has to write her contract, uh, write it out the rest of the year because they pick up their option, I think we're going to see a lot of going through the motions with her. That's just my my opinion because I think we're already seeing that on, on screen a little bit. It comes off believable when someone believes it, and it just looks like she's just doing her thing right now. The matches and the wrestling is always going to be great with Deanna. Always. Because she's incredible. Steph Delander, um, I'm, I'm still waiting to see something with her uh they promoted this as her second match in impact um tom hannafin let us know that this was a first time ever matchup so i said last week that he said he dropped that five times during the episode this episode he dropped it six times not to count out three times during this match that he has used that terminology. And you know me with beating a dead horse and making words mean nothing. We want first time matches, but if you're letting us know that two WWE jobbers are having a first time match, it probably doesn't need to be said. It's probably unnecessary. Um, and it really devalues devalues it. So just keep it, keep an ear out for it. Cause Tom will drop, will you know, we'll say this many, many times throughout the episode and it means nothing now. Um, so this was a first time ever matchup, which makes sense because Steph Delander is their second match period with the company. Uh, again, I, I didn't think she she really stood out. I thought last week was a Jordan Grace showcase match. You know, we do we don't have many uh, girls bigger than Jordan, so I said, hey, let's let's give it a chance for Jordan to show some gorilla, I mean a gorilla uh, German suplexes and and you know show off her strength. That that's what last week was. And where's Jordan this week? So what was the point? You know, um, I just didn't think it, it presented her in a good light. And then she wrestles here. The match is a little bit better. She gets to do a little bit more, but again, she loses. She's now Owen two. She is playing from behind with the impact audience. She's playing from behind with that live audience. Uh, Deanna wins with a tap out victory. Steph Delander taps out almost immediately. So um, right now they're telling us like, hey, this is an Alicia Edwards level um, jobber rather than here's a new knockout to get behind, uh, even as a heel. But I mean, get behind as far as, you know, someone who wants to be here, wants to make the company better. Like right now, she's not they're not showing her like she's she's someone who's going to make the show better. It's they're showing her as like we need someone to take a loss. Let's per, let's put her and her hair out there. So. um that was BTI, folks. These BTIs usually do about 30,000 viewers on YouTube. Um, I, I think that's fine. We kick it off now. Chris Bay, 
versus Kushida. And this was very similar to that tag team match from several weeks ago. Uh, that was, and this was again a great match. Chris Bay loses, but this isn't like when Chris Bay was the ultimate finesser. I know that's still his gimmick, but I mean, when he was just rolling solo and he was losing, we were constantly saying, Well, when are they going to do something with Chris Bay? Uh, now because he's part of a pretty popular faction and people are cheering for him, he does take losses, but we're not like it's not disgusting us, you know. Um, it was a roll-up finish because Impact is afraid to have people beat people sometimes. Um, but it, but it's a roll-up finish. It's the first roll-up finish of the show. So 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 keep this in mind. We're gonna talk finishes today here on the lounge. So um, Kashida wins again. Really really good match. Um, great way to start the show. They just need more of this. More of this to to kick it off. Not. Um, you know, Dango versus Brian Myers. Like that is not going to, to do it for you guys. And after this, we get, um, this was not good, but this was Santino Morella talking with Tommy Dreamer and Bully Ray. So we thought they were going old school, right? At no surrender. But instead, it looks like they're doing a live busted open with Dave LaGreco. Um, who, as I've said, annoys me a little bit. I'm not a big busted radio or busted open fan. Um, Am I saying I'm better than him? I'm a better podcaster? No, because that's all all subjective. But I don't particularly enjoy listening to them. I do sometimes when I'm bored and need a wrestling podcast I listen to. But this doesn't do a whole lot for me. Who is your target target audience? MLW's viewership in their second episode went down. But that's always going to happen because episode number one is, is the kickoff. That's when people are going to tune in out of curiosity. But they're kicking Impact's butt in the target demographic. They shouldn't kick their butt in anything. They're just, I said this last week, they're struggling to create a show that is geared towards a younger audience. This isn't going to help. Um, you know, it, it's Santino, it's Tommy, it's Bully Ray. There's purple lights in the background. Um, and then I guess they're going to do a beat the clock challenge next week. And whoever is wins and the fastest amount of time is going to speak first at no surrender, no surrender. Like, what is this? Probably Tommy Dreamer is going to wrestle one of the good hands. I don't know who they're going to put up against bully Ray. It, I would be leaning towards saying next week's episode is looking like it's going to be as bad as last week's, but that's not the case because the matches they're promoting for next week. Otherwise are really good. So I think, um, there's probably a, a place for this as long as it's not dominating the episode. Do I care? Absolutely not. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like this has to be leading towards them going old school, even as much as they want to push it off. I mean, what what the hell other you know outcome is out there? See, Macklin takes on Rhino, number one contenders qualifier match. Uh, I said this on Twitter. Even give it a like. Steve Macklin is how you present a veteran on wrestling television, a believable veteran. It's about portraying uh, a certain mentality, um, certain core values, even, even if it's a heel, there's certain core values that you portray and you make that the personality of the character and then it works. Lacey Evans is how you don't. Dressing in camouflage and saluting that is not relatable to a, a veteran and it's hokey to a non-veteran to the wrestling audience. But presenting Steve Macklin as a badass is how you do it. And there's this kind of unwritten thing in the military that the more you talk about what you did, the less you actually did. Like there's a lot in my career that I've done that I've seen places I've been, um, some crazy conditions I've had to live in. Uh, you know, I've, I've had, um, you know, people in my unit die. I wasn't, you don't hear me getting on here every episode and talking about that. You know, if someone wants to ask me questions about it, I'll talk about it. But that's like what the Lacey Evans character is more, more about the more you act like you did something, the less you actually did. Um, and yeah, you know, with Macklin, every once in a while, I can say, oh, you know what? 
think I think he was in the army. And, um, you know, sometimes I did this and this, saw this and this. I get it. Like you got to factor it in a little bit. But um, his his overall, uh, you know, character persona, this fits how you can how you make a, a, a believable veteran come across. He's he is a great character. He has one of the only good entrances in the company. Uh, so it's good when they show his full entrance. Sometimes he gets like that weird jobber entrance where he's already, you know, walking to the ring or he's already just got in the ring or something like that. I, I don't think that's smart. Uh, you know, it's one of the things that stands out on the show. Um, my thing about his matches right now is that I think he should be kicking ass more. I think he should be, you know, the match with Dongo, the match, you know, even this match with Rhino, like whoop their asses. You know, um, hopefully that's how the the four way is, because the other guys in the four way have no business winning. So he's going to win this. We know he's going to win this. And because we know he's going to win it, they have to make him look badass and dominant and not waste our time with some competitive match. Like have Steve Macklin really establish himself in this four way. So he beats Rhino. He beats him with the wake up call. And when this happens, I'm thinking to myself, there is no way in hell that Heath is going to win because he uses the wake-up call. There's not going to be two wake-up call finishes on this show. But then also, I'm like, Eddie's not going to win because PCO won last week, and they're not going to, with the blood feud they're doing here, I say blood feud in, in huge quotation marks because it's fake as a $3 bill. Um. They're not going to put him in the same match in a four way. They're just not. That's just not how wrestling works. You know, they're gonna they're gonna have a standalone feud. Eddie's gonna, you know, cost them the match or something along those lines, um, and then they're gonna move on to what they do. But uh, Steve Macklin wins and advances as he should. Uh, Gia Miller is uh, talking with Masha Slamovich after this, and her with the da and yet. Uh, I mean, speaking of military memories, um, you know, my first deployment uh, <laughs> was to a Russian country. And that's when I started. I'm, I'm 21 at this point, And that's when I'm learning da and yet. And uh, it was funny for me to over to, to hear that because it just kind of get, you know, it just brought back some funny memories for me. Um, but this was a nice little sit down. Uh, it wasn't too terribly long. There, there's red lights in the background. And I'm really curious to see what is the ultimate end game here with her inclusion in, in this with Mickey and with Bubba, because she's not going to win, but she also can't afford to lose. So what is the story going to be here? What are they going to do? No surrender. I'm very interested to see. I like her with the hair down a lot more than the hair up. Then we get Johnny Swinger versus Barry Horwitz. And this is... In the last three weeks, um, this is like at least the fourth, like really old guy they brought on the show. And it's not even the the last person on this show that shows up. We, we have another one in this match. And as I said, there's a place for Johnny Swinger versus Barry Horwitz on a card. If the rest of the card allows for it, if it's like last week where it's, bad comedy throughout the whole show and spookiness throughout the whole show. And there's nothing to write home about. There's not a, you know, there's no good matches. Then this stuff looks stupid, but there's a place for it. When the rest of the show allows for it, there to be a place for it. You just can't give us too much of it. So he wrestles Barry Horwitz. We know him as a, I mean, he's got to be in his late fifties, uh, but we know him as a, as a jobber. Jobber to the stars, one of the most popular jobbers of all time. We get this match going for a while, and then is the shocking, long-awaited return from the demon. Everyone's been asking for it, right? The demon to return back to Impact Television. And he moderately inconveniences Johnny Swinger enough for Barry Horwood to get the role of victory. So at this point, this is two roll-up finishes um, in the first three matches of this show. It was harmless, you know, totally harmless match. 
didn't take up too much time on the episode. Oh, it was fine. The demon thing was a little much. Then we get an interview with Gia Miller. You know, Gia was doing, I, I talked last time I was talking about BTI. She does the commentary in BTI. And I wish when Josh Matthews was doing commentary that they did this or they switched it up and gave us something new and fresh every once in a while because she actually does a fairly solid job on that show, uh, much better than I would have ever given her credit for. And it just gives something different. But she's backstage with Moose, and he says he's going to get even with Joe Hendry. He can show you better than he tell you, tells you. He goes outside. He starts whooping ass on this car. Out of nowhere. They're outside now. Out of nowhere, Santino Marella comes out. And it's just like the Scott Yamore, always in the right place at the right time thing. You're going to tell me he's he's in catering. He's outside. He's in the hallway. He's next to the entrance ramp into the ring. Santino is everywhere. And he notifies Moose that he is destroying his car, not Joe Hendry's car. At this point, he now punishes him by awarding him a global media championship match at No Surrender. And it's going to be a dot combat match. Last time they did a dot combat match, I was like, what is this shit? But um, it was good. I think it was Jordan Grayson and uh, Matt Cardona. And it was... Even though it was a hardcore match and it was silly, it it worked somehow. So uh, we'll see how these guys do hitting each other with with um, you know keyboards, choking each other with mouses. We'll, we'll see what it is, but I thought because it was a little different and it came off okay last time. And then we got Eddie Edwards versus Heath, and again, casual fan tuning in. What is Heath doing in this match? Could trying to qualify. For the number one contendership. Why is Rhino and Eddie Edwards in? Why do they get a second crack at the world title? Wasn't Rhino the first person pinned in the Golden Six Shooter? It's whatever. They obviously have don't have you know if they had main eventers enough to do this, Shira wouldn't have been in this match despite not wrestling since George Bush Senior was president. Uh, so they have a match here. It's okay, and then. For the second match in a row, there is a distraction in the entrance way. And then Heath hits the wake up call. So, at this point, and this is why I say sometimes impact episodes feel the same. At this point, we have had two roll up finishes, two distraction finishes. And two wake-up calls for the finish. That doesn't catch anybody off guard when they're laying these shows out. I, I'm like speechless at this point. Again, this didn't prevent me from enjoying the episode. But you can't end matches almost the same exact way throughout the night. It devalues... Um, that's why in the opening match, you don't put someone through a table or, or have them draw blood or hit a finisher that someone's going to use in the main event. You know, uh, I mean, shit, when Moose was wrestling for the world title or defending the world title, Rhino hit a spear in like the third match of the show. That's some of the gore and someone kicked out of it. So we're not pr protecting the champion's finisher on this show, you know? That was for Bound for Glory or whatever it was, or whenever Moose. It's I have no clue. I think it might have been Rebellion of last year, actually, when Moose was taking on Josh. So, um, as I always say, I just I'm looking forward to the Eddie PCO thing to be done. Uh, it, it's just the fakest feud, and I understand that it's long term booking. Like I get it, but it doesn't mean I have to enjoy it because I don't. Um. Then we go. What do we What do we got after this? The design, and he reveals, Dina reveals that him and Callahan are going to take on Frankie Kazarian and Yuya Uemura. This tells us right away that Yuya is going to take the loss, and it is leading towards step five of the design 23-step process uh, to be initiated into the group. Uh, we don't know what that, what step five is, and again, 
I don't understand this. Callahan is not there against his will, but he acts like he is. I'm giving this a long leash because I ultimately believe it's leading to something interesting. So I'm giving it a long leash. You know, Dreamer and Bubba Ray don't get a, a long leash from me. Um, but I'm will I'm willing to extend the leash here and see where the hell this is going. They have red lights behind them, by the way. And then we get purple lights with the hex and Father James Mitchell. I don't think Father James, Father James Mitchell, excuse me, Father James Mitchell is necessary for this because he wasn't the Hex's manager in NWA. I know they're they're trying to do a story with Rosemary. I just don't I don't really think it's necessary because the Hex are great on their own. They can they can stand on their own just fine. I don't really know why this is necessary. We're getting Allison K versus Ty Valkyrie next week, which was which is going to be great. I'm I'm really excited about that match. Um, but yeah, we're we're doing some of the spooky silliness, which is okay in moderation. Works on this show because there's great wrestling on the show as well. Then we get Alicia Edwards versus Masha Slamovich. We have seen Alicia lose, I mean, win twice. On the impact roster once against no three times i'm sorry one time against um rebel on impact plus one time against i think renee michelle on bti and then she beat laurel van s one time when she was on her way out of the company well when you see her coming down we already know whoever she's winning is gonna wrestling is gonna win um, and it, and it's a very quick match. It's a squash. And there's the fucking snowplow, which I really think for her character, they got to find something better. You know, I, I know it's fantasy booking. I've said in the past, I could see her doing one of those like reverse spinning power slams like Jeff Cobb does. And I just think it would be so much cooler than this move that is not that much different from the grace driver and mayhem for all. I know that's not really Macklin's finisher anymore, but it's, it's so just similar to some of these other ones that they use. I just want to see more creativity with these finishers, but Masha wins. she chokes her out after the match. And I think Mickey James came out and got choked out too. If I, I recall, I, I kind of stopped um, caring about it at that, at that point, but I've already kind of gone into de detail about this. Interested to see where it goes. And then we got Crazy Steve doing a little promo backstage. Crazy Steve's a great talker. He always sounds uh, really, really good, really well-spoken, poignant with the words. Um, I I was watching this, and I couldn't help but to wonder what would this have sounded like without the music behind it. Um, I'm not saying the music was totally out of place. It's not We on the Night for crying out loud, but... I was wondering what would it, how would this sound without the music? Would it be a little more intimidating, you know? Because uh, the in fact doesn't have an ear for music. We know that. Maybe there's a different type of music they could have put behind this, but um, I thought it was good. I'm looking forward to what they do. Uh, we're gonna forget that last week happened with the with the silliness backstage, where Trey is being fake scared. Uh, we're we're gonna pretend that th that didn't happen, and. Uh, move forward with this feud. And then we get Dirty Dango backstage with Santino. Um, I think Santino is involved with too much on the show because his gimmick works in very short stints. Uh, when he's forced to say too much, I think we start losing the gimmick. It's like, I can say, I can, you know, I go, damn it, Bobby. Quit jacking off to that mannequin. You know, like I can say a phrase like that. But then if I have to say, and you know, you could argue if I sound like him or not. But then if I have to go, Bobby, in the main event tonight of Impact Wrestling, there's going to be a first time. And now, the, now I start losing the, uh, 
I start losing the accent. I don't sound like him at all anymore because I'm not speaking in a way that's natural for what that character says. If this makes any sense to you whatsoever. My point is Santino has always been great with the one-liners and the small dialogue. But when he is asked to speak so much on a show so many times, I think we lose the gimmick. I think we, we, we lose the connection to it. I think it loses the humor because he doesn't have the history of needing to speak in these type of roles. It, this What he's doing now is not natural to the Santino character we used to see on TV. So I don't know if it, if it works. But because I like Santino, I can give it a little bit of a long leash. There are red and purple lights in the background, which I cannot give a leash to. Um, and Dango lets... Gresham and Speedball Mike Bailey know that they're going to have a tag team match versus the Motor City Machine Guns next week, which should be phenomenal. Let's not let's not uh, beat around the bush here. This could be one of the best matches of the year. Um, Gresham looks so small next to these guys, and I I don't care about someone's height. I re- I really don't. I I truly feel that uh, short shaming is a thing that still seems to be acceptable in our society. And I don't really agree with it. Um, Jonathan Gresham's jacked and he's in better shape than 99% of the people on the roster. Uh, But I just, the stark difference did stand out, stand out to me a little bit. Um, So this, this should be a really good match. I really think there should be more Jonathan Gresham on the show. I'm just kind of shocked that there isn't. Maybe it's his availability or something. I don't really know. Um, I do know that the red and purple lights are unnecessary though. Then we get some of Barry Horwitz backstage. He wants the same deal that Swinger got, 50 wins. And I was concerned that this fool was sticking around at this point. But then we quickly realize uh, he can't do that, and he's just going to go out on top. So that works. And then they read off next week's card and the New Japan card and no surrender. And it takes almost five minutes, or at least it feels like that. And it's we on the night through the entire thing. One of these days, they're going to switch up the damn song when they switch up the card so they're not just promoting an episode of Impact. They're going to do it one of these days. They are so stubborn in things that don't work. And the things that don't work, they're fast and loose with. It is, um, it's crazy. You know, I talked about that formula, the bookend strategy. It works for them, but it's not consistent. That's why I don't get excited about, you know, oh, we're announcing, you know, people just drag me over the coals for not being excited about Aftershock and and outside the ropes and, uh, you know, even BTI to an extent, because I was like, what? Where have they shown consistency for this type of content in the past? You know, um, they're consistent with We Own the Night and they're consistent with the Red. And they're consistent with the spirit of Hollywood lights. But the stuff that actually is good and actually works is not. Main event is Rich Swan versus Kenny King. Really good main event by two guys I really like a lot. Rich Swan was the best part, maybe the only good part about last week's show. Um, I'll throw Kenny King in there too. (coughs) Excuse me, because he was involved in that. And there showing a side of Rich Swan right now that we should have seen when he dropped the title the first time, or I guess the only time. This is what we should have been seeing from Rich Swan this entire time. Uh, and it, when they are organic with Rich Swan, that's when it works. When you try to force Rich Swan, it doesn't work. Because in the eyes of the wrestling fans, he's a little guy. Um, I don't think that's relevant. I think he's... I think he works as a world champion. I don't, he's, he's, it's not Darby Allen who's five foot three. I, I told you guys, I saw Darby in real life. I thought he was a kid dressed up like Darby Allen. Like, no shit. Um, that's not how Rich Swan is, you know? So, uh, even though he's a smaller wrestler, it, it, it works for me. Um, and he's not that much smaller than Josh Alexander. Josh, Josh looks a lot bigger on TV than he is. Um, so I don't think, uh, so I, th- I think him and Swan should like match up really, really well. 
Um, and I, and I, I stand by that. I think it's going to be the best match of impact in 2023. And there's already been some really good matches. And Kenny King's been involved in a couple, including this one. Uh, it ends with a roll-up finish. The main event of the match ends with a roll-up. It's the third roll-up of the show. The first match of the show ends up with a roll-up. The last match ends up with a roll-up. The middle match does. And then distraction finishes and wake-up calls. It's just all the same shit through the episode. But it was a good episode. It worked. Um, I think viewership will be... No, we, we know viewership already. But I think viewership for next week uh, should be solid as well. Because I think what they're... Even though we're getting to get this silly beat the clock stuff, um, I think everything else that they've surrounded it with is going to be good enough that that, you know, that there will be a place for that and it won't throw off the episode. After the match, Josh Alexander runs out because they're only going to go off the air with Josh Alexander, with Jordan Grace, Mickey James, really, even, even Mike Bailey to this point because they, they clearly hitch in the, the wagon to him. Frankie Gazarian. These are the guys that can go off the air with their hand raised or the last thing you see on the show. Rich Swan is not there yet. Um, I don't think in their eyes. Otherwise he would have went off the air with his hand raised, but maybe not because there was a segment after this <coughs> that normally I would say is unnecessary, but I understand what they're doing here. We have to transition from Swan and Josh Alexander going to have a good wrestling match to putting some kind of heat behind it. And we have to take two guys who are friends and we got to put a little bit of a divide and then we got to, uh, you know, we got to add some juice, some spice to this feud before no surrender. And I get it. Um, I guess this isn't the go home show. Cause the next one is, um, so I, I see it. And, and you know, Rich Swan went to super kick Kenny King accidentally catches Josh Alexander. He caught him good. He caught him on the chops really good too. And I think it was a good way to go off the air. So even it was, even though it was like, Hey, we got to get Josh out there to go off the air. Uh, it made sense and I can buy it. I can dig it, you know, and, and I'm really looking forward to the match. As I said, I, I just, I would be shocked if this wasn't top three, maybe even top one impact matches of 2023. And I know at the end of the year, they're going to be like, Hey, vote on your favorite match. And they're going to have some PCO versus Eddie Edwards in there. They're going to have Dango versus Brian might like, they're going to put some bullshit in there. But as far as a legitimate, legitimate match of the year, this, this one I'm sure is going to be in the conversation. I, I, I just can't imagine they put out anything but magic. So that's going to do it for me, folks. I'm your boy BQ. Thank God I'm done here recording this podcast for the second time in a row. Make sure you subscribe if it's your first time here. I'm your boy. I'm out. Peace.